Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Vaughn and I am going to uh, record a screencast video by request. Uh, so I've made up a problem that's very similar to problem 3 from chapter 9 in your My Stat Lab uh, for this week. So this kind of goes through all of the different steps related to hypothesis testing. And I think that this video uh, will help you also with problem 4 and maybe some of the other ones uh, for this week. Uh, so you'll see that this is very, very, very similar to the problem you have in, uh, in My Stat Lab. All right, so the problem is uh, written on here, and I'm going to go through this quickly. You can always pause and rewind to this video if you want to look at uh, some different uh, parts of it. So you have some information about a, a sample mean that's been collected, um, and the standard deviation of the population, uh, and you have a sample size of uh, 40 in this case. Um, and then they give you an alpha value, alpha equals 0 0.01, that you're going to use throughout the problem and uh, ask you to start with the different kinds of steps related to hypothesis testing. So the first of that is to determine the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, and I'll just uh, use the, the little font tool here in Word and say H0, is that the mean, so I can insert the symbol for mu, which is the mean, and in this case, uh, what you want to key on is uh, whether it's a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. And the real uh, uh, key word here is, is this part, is different from. It doesn't say it's greater than or is less than. We're actually testing for a difference in this case. And that tells us that we're going to have a two-tailed test. It could be greater than, it could be less than, it could be on either side. And so in the null hypothesis, we're always looking at the equals side of this equation. And so the null hypothesis is that the population... Uh, mean is actually equal to this value of one quart that it's supposed to be. There's one quart, even though our sample came in a little bit less than that. And then the alternative hypothesis in this case is uh, the opposite of that. And again, in the opposite of the equal side in this in this case is going to be the not equals. So we'll use the subscript, the H1, turn off the subscript tool, uh, put in, and you can just kind of... Uh, you know, you're not going to have to do this in my stat lab, but, but, you know, for the purposes here, I can do a copy and then change this uh, equal sign into a not equal sign. Now, uh, the not equal sign is not on the keyboard, so I have to use, the again, the symbol tool. I kind of find it this way. Okay, so this is our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis, keying on the fact that it's a two-tailed test because it says is different from instead of is larger than or less than. All right, so now we want to find the test statistic. We are using a z-test because we have a known population standard deviation and uh, a big enough sample size. We can use the, the central limit theorem to guarantee the, the normal distribution of the, dis, uh, the sampling distribution of the mean. All right, so our, our test statistic is going to be z-stat. And we're going to compute that uh, by using the, uh, the formula, which is the difference between the population, the sample mean, and the population mean divided by the standard error. Um, and, and so that's the formula that's in the book. It's the one you should have gone over in class this week. And now what I've done is we're going to start using Excel to calculate a few of these things. So what I've done now is just typed in. There's no, no computations of anything. I just kind of uh, gave a little bit of a head start to typing in the uh, relevant information that's in the description of the problem. We have our alpha value, the hypothesized mean, that's the what the bottles are supposed to hold with the grape juice, and then what the observed sample mean was, and then the given population standard deviation from the problem, and then also the sample size, which is not 50, but in this case is going to be 40. All right, so now we're going to go through and compute first the Z stat. Uh, now the Z statistic is uh, this uh, equals. Um, the difference, like I said, between the sample mean and the hypothesis mean divided by the standard error. In order to compute the z-stat, though, I need to first compute the standard error. And we're going to need this later in the problem anyway. So let's uh, go ahead and, and type in uh, our first computation here, the standard error. And we compute the standard error by taking the standard deviation, so equals the population standard deviation, and divide by the square root of the sample size. All right, so there's our standard error. Now I can find the z-stat. 
And that's going to be the difference, so equals parentheses, the sample mean minus the hypothesized mean, and then divide by the standard error. All right, so my z stat is going to be equal to negative 2.77 when I round it to two decimal places. Okay, now we need to find the critical values. And the critical values are when you take that alpha, and you remember we're in a two-tailed test, so you want to take that alpha region and you split it into these two different tails. So we take alpha divided by 2, and then we're going to find the plus or minus z value that kind of split off the, in this case, 0 0.005, half of the alpha value on the left and on the right. So I'll find both of those z-critical values. There are two in this case because uh, we're doing a two-tailed test. So we'll first find the z-critical value on the left by taking equals norm.inv, inverse normal distribution. And we'll take a parentheses. And for the probability, I'm going to do alpha divided by 2. So this will be the left one. It's going to separate 0 0.005 on the left from all the other values on the right. And because we're using a Z curve, uh, the standard normal distribution curve, we do a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. All right. So the left critical value is going to be negative 2.58 when I round it to two decimal places. Now for the right one, I'm going to do the same thing, equals norm dot in. Um, the only thing is that now I need to take the, the upper um, value. So I want half of alpha to the right, which means I need everything else to the left. So I'm going to do that 1 minus, and then alpha divided by 2, with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And again, these should be the same number, just one of them is negative and one of them is positive because of the symmetry of the z distribution. All right, so those are my critical values, and when you go to enter this in um, my stat lab, you need to enter it with uh, a comma in between, negative 2.58, and then comma, positive 2.58. All right, and so uh, now we're going to do our final conclusion. So based upon our Z stat and our critical value, what I'm going to observe here is that the Z statistic, negative 2.77, is to the left of the lower um, critical value over here. So this Z statistic, negative 2.77, is below negative 2.58, and therefore it falls in the rejection region. So our conclusion here is to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and when you reject the null hypothesis, there is sufficient evidence um, to determine that uh, there is a difference in the mean amount of grape juice. in the container or part. Now again, in my math lab, this will just be, uh, or my stat lab, this will just be a little radio button that you have to choose the right one. The key thing here is uh, to know that uh, when you reject, you have sufficient evidence, and that's when this value is um, to the left of the lower critical value or above the upper critical value. You're in the rejection region. If you're in between these two values, then you're in the fail to reject region, and if you're fail to reject, you always say there's insufficient evidence to make a conclusion. Um, it's, you never use sufficient with fail to reject, and you never use insufficient with the reject decision. And you're always rejecting the null hypothesis. All right, so now we're going to go on to part B. We're going to compute what's called the p-value. And uh, the p-value is uh, when you take that observed z statistic and you turn it into a probability. So the p-value, and we'll just uh, do a little... Uh, system down here is is using that norm uh, dot distribution the normal distribution and determining how what probability is lies to to the left of your z statistic and above the corresponding positive z statistic and that kind of tells you you know what proportion of the po what proportion of the population is actually further away than your observed z statistic and you're trying to say if that's 5% or less or 5% or more so I'm going to do this as equals norm.dist parentheses, and I'm going to use the z statistic with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. But I'm not quite finished because, um, oh, I'm sorry, I have to put the true in here also. 
for the accumulated value. Uh, but I'm not quite finished because that's actually only going to give me the proportion that's lower than the Z stat. I also want the amount that's going to be above the corresponding positive Z stat. Uh, and because of the symmetry of the normal distribution curve, I could just take this and do two times. So my p-value in this case is 0 0.0056. So to three decimal places, I would round that to 0 0.006. All right, and now we're going to interpret the meaning of this p-value. So since this uh, p, since if the p is low, you reject the null hypothesis. If the p is low, reject the hope. So since our p-value, 0 0.006, is less than our alpha value, which was 0 0.01. So that's P is less than alpha. Uh, that means we do reject the null hypothesis. And since we reject the null hypothesis, again, um, we can determine that there is sufficient evidence that there is a difference in the mean amount of grape juice in the carton from what they said it was supposed to be, which was one quart. All right, so we reached a consistent decision by looking at the p-value and comparing it to alpha, as opposed to up here, where we compared the z-statistic to the critical values. All right, now we're going to go on to part C, and that asks us to con construct a 99% confidence interval estimate of the population am uh, mean amount of juice per one quart carton. All right, so our confidence interval and we'll do this as a low and as a high. So to get the low end of the confidence interval, you're going to take the sample mean, that's always in the middle of the confidence interval, and we're going to subtract the product with the, the margin of error, which is the product of the standard error and the observed statistic, the critical statistic. So we're going to take B1 minus this Z statistic, so it's a good thing we got the positive one here, because otherwise we'd have a problem with the minus and minus, and then times the standard error. Okay, this is our uh, critical statistic, this is our standard error, together that gives us the margin of error, and we're going to subtract that to get the low, and we're going to add it to get the high. Okay, so here's the a low end of my confidence interval, and the equals the uh, observed sample mean, now I do plus, the Z statistic times the standard error. And that'll give me the high end of my confidence um, interval. So uh, over here, I would write the, uh, again, on my stat lab, you'll just fill in the blanks. But over here, I'd say that the confidence interval goes from a low of um, 0.986 to a high of 0.9995. So it's actually very close, and we draw an appropriate conclusion. So since 1 is not in the confidence interval, we conclude that um, there is a difference. In other words, it's not likely that the true population mean of 1 um, is... is um, you know, that, that our observes, observed mean does not contain that one, and therefore it's not likely that one is the real true population mean as it's supposed to be. All right, so, so what you're looking at here is whether the, the hypothesized mean is inside or outside of the confidence interval, and in this case it's outside of the confidence interval, and so that again is a way in which we can reject the null hypothesis. All right, and that's uh, pretty much it for this question. The rest of them are just kind of asking you some questions. Compare the results of A and C. Are the results the same? Of course, they were. In part A, we rejected the null hypothesis. In part C, we rejected the null hypothesis. They were three different ways, A, B, and C, to kind of reach the same decision. Um, and then in part E, which I'm not going to do on this particular video, what they actually give you is uh, some data. They give you the... Uh, p-value, they give you the confidence interval, and they give you the z-statistic. Um, you use the same critical value, 
uh, for a larger standard deviation. You don't need to go back and recompute those things. They just give you those values. And so what you're doing in Part E is kind of going through and uh, reaching the same kind of conclusions. Do you reject the null hypothesis or not? Do you reject the null hypothesis or not? Do you reject the null hypothesis or not? In each one of these A, B, C kind of cases. Now, uh, when I did this in my stat lab, it, it did actually was in the fail to reject region by increasing the standard deviation. I don't know what it's going to be in your case. And again, I'm going to leave you to try and figure out this piece. All right, uh, this is Dr. Vaughn. I hope this uh, video is useful to you and uh, have a great day.